Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries, Church at the Barn, Saturday Night Life. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 8? I'm going to uh, spend a little time here this evening looking at the difference between conviction and condemnation. Because I believe conviction is a very good thing. And condemnation is a horrible thing from hell. That we shouldn't have any part of it at all. I want to see that in the Bible. But talk about the difference because it is pretty easy for people to not find that line. Let's de define it. Simple definition of conviction is uh, the finding or the, the determining that you're guilty of an offense, found guilty of offense. Another meaning would be uh, convinced of an error. Uh, so it could be, you know, a mild conviction for something mild. It can be conviction for something pretty serious. It's, it is the, it, the finding of guilt. Condemnation, on the other hand, is the punishment for guilt. Passing judgment. And the Bible says 60 some times that we are to judge, and it says 60 some times that we're not to judge. So, which is it? Judge or judge not, because you can find them a lot in the New Testament. Jesus uh, instructing the church you judge what's going on, judge sin. And you should, if you're convicted of sin, you should plead the blood, stand in, God, stand in God's righteousness. The first time that a human being answers to conviction, it'll be the new birth. And that's pretty, that's so far over in conviction that you know you're going to be condemned if you, don't, if you don't do something about this condemnation, you will be judged guilty by God. And you find that out, and you receive Jesus as Lord of your life. You know, some people receive Jesus because they find out how good he is, and they just want in on that. Some people find Jesus because they find out about hell, and they don't want to go there. <laughs> and they receive life instead. It does, the point is, once you've received Jesus as Lord and you're no longer a lost man with Adam's sin, you've now been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, then don't fall for this idea that because of grace, now you can do anything you want and, and uh, there's not going to be any consequences for it because that's not scripturally true. It's a popular message. People like to hear it, and you can get a lot of listeners. But it's not scriptural. Once you've received Jesus as Lord of your life, and you do something contrary to God and what God likes, there'll be something called conviction. Uh, there'll be a knowing of wrong. And it'll, it'll come in your heart, in your spirit, in the reborn part of you, in your conscience. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit. The Holy Ghost has taken up residence in your spirit. So when the Spirit of God talks, and you, then your conscience responds because they're together in there. When your conscience has got a little nag in there, that's conviction. The best thing for a believer to do is learn how to answer that conviction almost immediately. I mean, as soon as there's something nagging in there, just, what is it, Lord? What, 
What is it? And if he shows you somewhere where you're off, or maybe you said something to somebody, um, maybe you did something, it, it, you just confess it. When you confess it, isn't when you confess it isn't when God finds out about it. When you confess it is when you get rid of it. And the conviction leads you to plead the blood over it and walk in his righteousness instead of floundering around off, off track, out of the path. It gets you back in the narrow way. It's, what it's, it's a good thing. Conviction is an excellent thing that you want to develop. You want to develop the ability to hear when something's not right. The voice in your spirit is very often uh, a green light. Mm, just, mm, just, you're on the right track. And then you get a... Uh, that's conviction in the mildest sense. Okay, now condemnation is uh, you're, you're, uh, you're guilty. You're wrong. You're no good. You're bad. That's, that's not, not if you're born again, you're not. You've been made righteous. Grace bought you. Mercy demanded and grace provided righteousness and you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean you can keep on doing what's nagging in your spirit and not pay a price, but the price won't be eternal judgment. It's just sowing and reaping. Things go wrong in this life and there's, if you're a believer, there's some way that the devil wormed his way in there. And instead of hunting for that and wondering what happened, why did that happen to me? I mean, I'm so good, that shouldn't have happened to me. The best thing to do is just cut to the answer and get rid of that. We spend too much time trying to figure out what happened. We should be spending that time believing God for the deliverance. You can't. You can't do both. If you start looking for what's wrong and, and you keep repenting of something you already repented of, you must not have repented by faith. If you don't repent by faith, you don't get free. The reason that when God convicts you of something that's wrong, the reason you want to confess it so you get free of it. Wipe it out of there. No more consciousness of sin. Hebrews the book of Hebrews said we should no longer have a conscience In our conscience, we shouldn't be concerned with sin. So when it comes up, that's conviction. Get rid of it. We're not supposed to be living in that. How do you get rid of it? Confess it. Father, that's, that's sin. And I repent. With your help, I'm not going to do that again. Change me. Help me. Thank you for pointing it out. And thank you for the blood that cleans me in Jesus' name. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Did you find Romans yet? Did I say Romans? Chapter 8. Now what I'm going to do here tonight is read the Message Bible. And uh, I'm going to back up into Romans 7 for ways and then just read here. I'm probably starting uh, I'm going to have to start clear back in verse 17 and I'm, it still kind of sounds like I'm in the middle of something but it'll come clear here and then I'm going to read through the first five verses of ch chapter 8 like this was written in a letter but I need something more for if I know the law but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can, I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me. 
and gets the better of me every time. This is what happens to someone who has not received Jesus. This is conviction that will eventually lead to condemnation if they don't do something about it right here. This is the lost, this is what a lost man's looking at. Romans 7. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Now remember, this is a Jew. He wasn't born again. He was trying to keep the law to be righteous, and he couldn't do it. And that's what, this is Paul talking about pre Damascus Road. Uh, parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. There's no one who can do anything for me. Isn't that the real question? But the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. When the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that fateful dilemma with the revival of Jesus the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under continuous, low-lying, black cloud. What is that? It's condemnation. Don't have to do that anymore. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the juggler when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. It is his son, Jesus. He personally took on the human condition entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code weakened as it always was by the fractured human nature could never have done that. Nobody could make this work except Jesus. So he came down here and made it work. And he fixed this Romans 7 problem so that Romans 8 is what is available to us. When you, before you're born again, this Romans 7 conviction is, is letting lost people know you are staring condemnation in the face. If you don't, if you don't let Jesus fix that, You're going to be condemned. Now, when people say, I'll let Jesus fix it. I believe he died for me. I believe he's alive. He rose from the dead, and Jesus is Lord of my life. Then the Spirit of God goes inside you to dwell, and you're no longer to have anything to do with condemnation ever again. Condemnation is not anything that comes anywhere near you except by devils, by Satan and the organization underneath him, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places operate in condemnation. You're no good. You're a mistake. You're sorry. You're bad. Just ever, ever heard that voice? Everybody's heard that voice. That's a voice of hell. And it's loud in your head sometimes, depending on your emotion, depending on what you did, depending on who's doing the condemning. Sometimes it's just inside your um, head. 
That's not God. If God's convicting you, it's in your heart. And that's, a, that's something you don't want to ignore. But if it's in your head and it's noisy and it's loud, you don't have to listen to that. There's a lot of ways to handle that. First way to handle it is don't say anything that tips off the source of that voice that you heard him. Because he can't read your mind. He can throw thoughts at it, but he doesn't know whether they got through or not unless you react. Drive him nuts. You don't have to say anything. And there's another way to handle it. You can just take that thought and reject it, rebuke it. That's not my thought in the name of Jesus. I know where that come from. That's condemnation, and I'm not under condemnation. But now let's read the, uh, I'll read the new, no, I'll read the Amplified edition. Not the Amplified classic, but the Amplified. I know that's confusing. I think they did it on purpose to get people to buy their new book. Romans, it is different. So Romans uh, 8, I didn't say it's better. It is different. Uh, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment. That's in, remember, we talked about in this edition. It's in brackets. It's their study notes finding their way into the text. And this is brackets. No guilty verdict. No punishment. I believe they're very accurate with that. That's what the translation lacks. Therefore, there is now no condemnation in English. It's lacking the understanding you'd have had reading that in Greek. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Zip. Zero. For those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in Him as personal Lord and Savior. So you've received Him as Lord. Now there's no, don't let condemnation be a part of your life ever again. I don't care if it's your wife condemning you. Don't listen to that. Or your husband condemning you. Do not listen to that. Well, the Bible says, be careful. Submit, the Bible says, submit your husband. No, it doesn't. Not to anything. If he's against God, you submit to God first. When your husband and God aren't in agreement, who are you going to submit to? It better not be your ungodly husband. Not if you want to stay in the blessing. You submit to God. I'm going to pause for effect because... That's not a real popular statement in a lot of Christian denominations. But the problem with a lot of Christian teaching is they're using condemnation to make people feel bad so that they come back for more. Why would people that get feel bad come back for more? It's human nature. The fallen side, not the, not the nature you get when you receive Jesus as Lord, but the old man uh, gets used to being browbeat, and it needs its fix. It needs to come back and get browbeat some more. But God is not in that for the believer. Conviction's in your heart, and it's, it's uh, hey, stop that. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. That's what the don'ts and do's in the Bible or in the New Testament are for. Don't do that. Do this. It's convicting you. That's wrong. Stop it. Do that's right. Act righteous and you'll quit doing the wrong thing. Do the right, do the right thing. You can't do them both. Pick the right one. So... Uh, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Condemna condemnation is under the law of sin and death. You're free of that. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has conviction in it. It'll tell you when you're doing something wrong, but your judgment is, is not guilty. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because when you do something wrong and you're convicted of it and you plead the blood over it, the gavel comes down, not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Why don't people want to confess their sin to God? It's not guilty every time. It's a fixed court. The high court of the universe, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and they agree that they've made you righteous. Now act like it. Pray like it. Yeah, live like it. Walk like it. Think like it. Think, say, and act. Righteous. Verse uh, 2, 3. For what the law could not do, that is, overcome sin and remove its penalty, its power. Being weakened by the flesh, that's man's nature without the Holy Spirit. What, the, what law couldn't do, God did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh, subdued it. Overcame it in, in the person of his own son, so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not live our lives in the ways of the flesh, guided by worldliness and our sinful nature, but live our lives in the ways of the Spirit, guided by his power. So you have a choice, even after you're born again, to walk in what God put inside of your spirit, or to walk in what you were walking in before you got born again. It's a choice. Actually, it's a continual series of choices, hundreds of choices every day, sometimes several choices in a minute. And you can pick right every time because you have a helper on the inside of you that helps you pick by convicting you of the wrong choice and leading you into the right choice. That's what the don't say, so don't do that, that's the wrong choice. He leads you over here, do this. That's the right thing to do. So, <clears throat> let's now look please at uh, John 3. And 316, everybody knows except Mondale. You remember that? Guy running for president against? He said, uh, he, he said you should, uh, anyway, it says, says John 316, he said John 163. Have you ever read John 163? It says they did, they did not know him. I'll read it real quick. I don't have to sidetrack here. John 16, 3. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. <laughs> John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now look at 18. And I'll read this, amplify it again. Whoever believes and has decided to trust in him as personal Savior and Lord is not judged. For this one, there is no judgment, no rejection, no condemnation. But the one who does not believe and has decided to reject him as personal Savior and Lord is judged already. That one has been convicted and sentenced because he has not believed and trusted in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God, 
the one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, the one who alone can save. This is the judgment. That is the cause for indictment, the test by which people are judged, the basis for the sentence. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. For every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light but shrinks from it for fear that his sinful worthless activities will be exposed and condemned. But whosoever practices truth and does what is right morally, ethically, spiritually comes to the light so that his works may be plainly shown to be what they are accomplished in God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, in dependence on him. So there's two ways to live. The way you feel like, when you feel like it, doing what you want, when you want, how you want. Or letting Jesus be Lord of your life and lead, let Jesus lead, the Holy Spirit lead, and you follow their lead. Instead of leading them, they lead and you follow. Yes. Very simple concept. Very backwards to the natural way of doing things. Natural man likes to be the boss. Depending on a personality type, some people don't really want to make any decisions but they still don't want anybody making any decisions for them when they don't feel like it. Most of the time they feel it's okay, it's okay. But then when they don't, they don't. And every personality type has, on the fallen side, will bull up against the leading of the Lord. Because God's gonna ask you and I to do some things Sometimes that we don't want to do. He's going to ask, he's going to say, don't do that, and we want to. And he's going to say, do this instead, and we don't want to. And every time that happens, you can pick life or you can pick death. Now, we read in Romans 8 that this, there's a spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And there's a law of sin and death. When you pick right, you go under that, you go under that blessing area where you're protected by the blood of the Lamb. You pick wrong, you step outside the blessing, and you're over here where you can get in trouble. And it doesn't always happen in the way you'd expect. But it's not good. The curse is not good. It, it's not edifying reading, but you can read about it in Deuteronomy 28. The curse is verse 15 through 68 or something like that. whole bunch, verse after verse after verse after verse after verse describing the curse. And three times in that long read, it said, if it's bad and it's not in here, it's a curse. The curse of God... The curse that God put in the planet is to contain the devil. That's as far as the devil can go. It's a fence. It holds evil in a box. It's a good thing. God spoke it in order, it's because it has to be. There's nothing wrong with having it. It's a good thing to have a cage for God's anti-God, anti-Christ has got to stop there. But it's also, in, because God said it, that means it's active. And now he's going to tell his kids how to stay out of that. Don't do that. It's like setting up an electric fence. <laughs> Let's say you put, up a, you put up an electric fence to keep bad things off this area. We usually do it in this country to keep our livestock in, but some people fence to keep other people's livestock out with electric. Not a bad idea either, but <laughs> what was I doing before I sidetracked myself? The, yeah, there's a, 
there's a box there. There's a, there's a containment area. So do you want to touch your own electric fence? Why would you want to do that? To see if it's hot? I wonder if it's working. <laughs> it's working. It's there to keep out what you don't want and to keep in what you do want. And the, the, God put that curse up there and then told us where it's at. Don't touch the electric fence. Duh. Don't do that. The fence is hot. Don't do that. Do this. Get out or get in the, get in the middle of the blessing over here. The land of milk and honey, Canaan land, is in the middle of that blessing. It doesn't get better than that middle of the blessing in this earth right now. Get over here where the good is and stay away from that fence. So, let me, let's do this. Uh, I want to just work on a, seeing the difference between conviction and condemnation for a minute so that you can recognize it in yourself and your own thought life. So you can recognize it when somebody that you know is uh, talking to you. Uh, so you can recognize it when you're listening to the Word of God preached. Because if it's Bible and it's a preacher uh, preaching a word, there's going to be conviction. There'll be condemnation in it for sinners. But there'll be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there'll be conviction for people who are in Christ Jesus and they're not. They're messing around with the boundary line. Get over here in the middle. Get away from that fence. That's just, that's a good thing, see. So, conviction will sound like this. You made a mistake. That's wrong. Condemnation, you are a mistake. You never do anything right. Conviction draws you to God. Condemnation, it uh, pushes you away from God. That's why there's so many people that I don't go to church in. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't need church. The mountain's my church. You know, I just, and all those anti-Bible ideas that people get, where'd it come from? Condemnation. They got, they got to listen to condemnation and they don't like it because they're born again. I don't blame them. They shouldn't like it, but they're blaming the wrong thing, of course, because they're listening to the wrong Voices are listening to voices in their head thinking they're some kind of a brilliant genius when they should be listening to their heart where the real um, the leader lives. Okay, so here's kind of conviction uh, is for repentance and humility while condemnation is for shame and fear. The conviction will say, you made a wrong choice. Condemnation will say, you're stupid and useless. You never do anything right. You hear people doing that to their kids. That's not a good father, that's a bad father doing it that way. Uh, conviction always has hope in it an expectation of things coming out right. And condemnation is full of despair and fear. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit and He's a giver. And He gives you conviction so that you can live in the blessing. The devil's a thief and he comes to steal and he, he's, he's not going to give you anything. Nothing's free over there in that.
condemnation area, it's there to steal from you. The uh, Holy Spirit, using conviction, deals with issues. But the devil, using condemnation, deals with your identity. He's telling you who you are, and he's making you feel like you're less. In fact, the devil is one, and condemnation is behind false humility, and false humility is the backside of pride, and it's putting yourself down. Humility will, is not godly if you're putting yourself down. You can't put yourself down when you're a temple of Almighty God for crying out loud. How silly is that? Well, the Bible says, be, be sure you read it carefully. You don't put yourself down to lift people up. You lift people up where you're at. That's what humility does. It picks the whole population up where God put us. But you don't, you don't, only false humility says you're less than what the Bible says you are in Christ Jesus. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, that sounds real pretty, but it's a Bible lie. It's religious, but it'll get you so full of condemnation, and it'll get you hurt. You won't be able to live in victory. Not believe in that. You are not an old sinner if you got saved by grace. It's impossible. You're one or the other. Either you got saved by grace, so you're the righteousness of God in Him, or you're still a sinner and you need to get saved by grace so that you're the righteousness of God in Him. But you should not be a sinner any longer. There's no reason to be. Jesus fixed that problem if you'll just take him up on it and then get in agreement with what he said. Amen. Every time you say, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, you're out of agreement with God and you're taking yourself out of the blessing, smack into the place where the devil has a free shot at you. The blessing is protection from the curse. Saying things that aren't scripturally lined up with what the Spirit of God leading in your heart and in the Word is like grabbing the electric fence just to see if it's hot. <laughs> Every time I talk about electric fence, I, th I, I, uh, I have little flashbacks. I had a very ornery uncle who was always trying to tangle kids up in electric fences. And this, is, this was dairy, we were in dairy country, and these fences are not just electric fences. Uh, many of them were direct current. And uh, I mean, they would knock you down. And, and uh, my uncle thought that was hilarious. <laughs> the farther you rolled, the funnier he thought it was. <laughs> this it, it's a good uh, it's a good analogy for the difference between a blessing, the difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction's a good thing, keeps you away from the fence, and condemnation just gets you over there where you just grab right onto it. Um, the Holy Spirit and and with, through conviction gives hope. The devil, through condemnation, leaves you hopeless. The Holy Spirit, with conviction, leads you to repentance. The devil drives you to remorse. The, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, through conviction, teaches you how to walk in humility. While the devil, through condemnation, teaches you that you're a mistake. There's something wrong with you. That God stuff is okay for other people, but that you got a flaw in you. The, the conviction of the Holy Spirit draws you to God, and condemnation 
from the devil pushes you away from God and it traps you in pride. It, the person's only going to take so much of that and then they're going to they're going to bull up and fight against it. I don't want any part of that God stuff. They're just hypocrite. You've heard that so many. You, 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 th when you hear somebody talking like that, this is what happened. They got to listen to condemnation until they think that's all there is to this. And really all that happened is they've got in a trap they need help out of. What is the way to get somebody out of that that's in that? Intercessory prayer. You have got to get involved in the invisible and you've got to tear down the strongholds around that individual that have been put up there over year after year after year after lie after lie after lie. They're believing lies. And they've built a thought process of lies and it needs to be taken down. Intercessory prayer can do that. Hallelujah. So, the word uh, in the Bible to remember is justify. We have been justified by the blood of Jesus and justification is a pardon. You're clear, you're clear from guilt. You did something wrong, you're convicted of what you did wrong, but you're justified and pardoned for it, so just plead the blood. Walk in freedom. Walk in freedom all day, every day. That is grace. Grace doesn't mean you can have anything you feel like and you're okay. That's not what grace, that's not what grace is. Grace is what keeps you walking in the, walking with God without any guilt or condemnation. Why? Because when you, when they're, before guilt and condemnation can get anywhere near you, the, the Spirit of God and grace convicts you. And then you use the grace to get it out of your life. You don't have to, you don't have to go back and do it right. Jesus did that part. And then grace allows you to take advantage of what Jesus did. Grace will trade you what you deserve. Once you're convicted, just take the trade. Take what Jesus deserves for that and give him what you deserve for what you just did and walk free. That's what grace is. It's not so that you can keep doing the wrong thing over and over again. It's so you can get out from under the wrong thing when, you, when you're convicted of it. If, there, if, if somebody is looking for a way to live in this life and sin and get away with it. They need to check and be sure they're even born again or not. Amen. Born again people aren't looking for a way to sin and get away with it. They're looking for a way to live without sinning. And there is a way. And, and we're all over it. Embrace conviction. Listen to it. And be quick to repent. Stay out of whatever the check is about. Just plead guilty. Because every, every time you plead guilty, the court says, bought by the blood. The gavel comes down and your blood, you're, because of the blood, you're free. Justified. Justified is Old English. The easiest way to just to remember it is just as if I never sinned. Justified. The blood of Jesus justified me. And because of the blood, it's alive. I live just as if I never sinned. And the Bible said, the people say, if you preach the gospel that way, you're just giving people a license to sin. No, that's not what this is about. It's given people a way to live without sinning. Not by trying hard, 
But by living for God, if you, if you just focused on God and doing what he said and, and staying away from the fence, you're not sinning. Can you live this life without sinning? Yes, it's possible. But when you make a, if you make a mistake, just stay free anyway. But you keep going for God, and here, here's the point of the message. If you keep going for God and you keep living like this, that still small voice gets clearer and clearer and clearer. And it gets to where you can hear, the, you can hear God in a turmoil around you. When you're going through something that's confusing your think tank, and it's like, you just no, no mental explanation for it whatsoever. You drop down in here and there's just this. Mm -hmm. Then we sang that song tonight. I trust you. I trust you. I don't need to know everything that's going on. Why? I got this. And I got a green light down here. And if I'm off, it's going to tell me I'm going to repent and it'll be back green. I'm going to live in the green. I'm not getting anywhere near that fence. It's hot. It hurts. I don't like it. I'm going to stake out the center of this property and stay right there in the middle. And God will bring everything I need right there where I'm at. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for convicting your children. You chasten those you love. You show us when we're off. And I thank you for uh, changing us from the inside out to be just like you. Thank you for this process. One level of glory to another level of glory. Line upon line, precept upon precept, growing in the new creation. In Jesus' name, amen.